In this tutorial, we're going to look at IS8 and IFRS 15. So the first question, uh, true, is looking at IS8, which is looking particularly here at a change in accounting policy. So given the financial statements for 2017 and 2018, so these are the, the, the financial statements that are already prepared, which are told here that true historically valued inventory using the FIFO method. So these accounts have been prepared using the FIFO basis uh, to measure inventory, which is allowed under IS2, but they've decided to change into a weighted average. Now you should know, and it's not mentioned anywhere in the question, it's not mentioned what standard about changing accounting policy is. This is IS8. And you're only allowed to change an accounting policy either one, because it's allowed under the international accounting standards or it's required, or two, that it gives better information. And you're told here that's why the directors want to change from the FIFO method to weighted average, and they give you the changes there. And they tell you the retained earnings is the start of the two year period, end of 15, start of 16. And they say the cost of sales above includes that uh, inventory value of the FIFO method, and OCI is related to the revaluation surface of PP. So what they're asked to do then is restate the statement of profit and loss for 2017. Now we'll do 2016 just for illustration purposes as well, to include comparative figures, which means do 2016, and the extract from the 2017 statement change method. Because remember, if you do a change in accounting policy, it must be applied retrospectively. That means you must go back and say, well, if we changed this policy last year, what would the profits look like? What would the financial statements look like? So what I've done is I've taken the two statements as they are and I've just copied them into Excel. And the main thing that's changing here, no other line item will change other than these two, cost of sales. So that's where inventory impacts the PNL. We're not asked for a statement of financial position, but we are asked for an extract from a statement of change in equity, which we'll get to in a second. So from our first instance, we need to look at what about the 2016 accounts? So if we go back and think about it, well, if we had changed the evaluation method for inventory last year, not just for 2017, what would have happened? Well, in the 2016 accounts, your opening inventory, which is the end of the previous year, is currently in at 140. It'll now go to 160. Right? So your opening inventory is going up by 20,000. And at, in 2016, your closing inventory is going up by 35,000. So there's the two impacts you're going to have in last year's accounts. So if you want to show that, just illustrate it. Your opening inventory in 2016 is going up by 20,000. Your closing inventory in 2016 is going up by 35k. So up by 20 and up by 35k. So what impact is that going to have on my cost of sales? Well, my opening inventory is going up by 20k. That is increasing my cost of sales from 130,000 going up another 20. Because the higher the opening inventory, uh, the higher the cost of sales. But your closing inventory is going up, so that means you're going to add back 35. That means you're reducing cost of sales by 35. So the net impact on profits there is a net increase in profits of 15. So that's important to understand, a net increase in profits of 15. Opening inventory is going up, which reduces profits. Closing inventory is going up, which increases profits. So if you bring that down along then, that's the only thing that changes. You take those off. You take off your tax expense. And you're left with 42,000 instead of 27. So the old one I'll put here was 27. So by changing the accounting policy from measuring using FIFO to measuring using weighted average, your profits go from 27 up to 42. So in 2016 accounts, the increase there was 15,000, which is the difference here. So that's important to understand where those adjustments are coming from. If you went back one step further, given the information you had 2015, the only adjustment in 2015 for the information we have is the closing inventory in 15 will be 20,000 higher. So if you wanted to put there just for completeness, 
2015 impact would mean closing inventory would be 20k higher so profits in 2015 would be 20k higher so if you went back and retrospectively did that we don't have to do the 2015 accounts that's why we kind of leave it to one side they would be 20k higher because of course if you adjust inventory inventory straddles two accounting periods always so here if we're adjusting the opening inventory in 2016 which is this you must be adjusting the closing inventory of 2015 as well so 2015 profits would be 20 higher 2016 profits would be 15 higher and we do the same thing for 2017 just to show the point in 2017 if we continued on this the opening inventory in 2017 will be now 195 so 2017 opening inventory would be 35k higher and 2017 closing inventory would be 60 grand higher so think about that logic again now you're making these adjustments this is where it's kind of tricky that you can watch what you're doing these this is the cost of sales figure assuming no adjustments were made if we now revalue our inventory our opening inventory should be 35 higher that means our cost of sales is going to be 35 higher so you see the closing inventory from the previous year into opening inventory here and your closing inventory should be 60,000 higher the higher my closing inventory the lower my cost of sales so that debit and credit would be debit and the inventory cost is debit inventory current asset 60 credit cost of sales 60 so you're trying to adjust it back to see well if i adjust both opening and closing inventory what will my cost of sales figure be it will go from 520 down to 495 so that will make my new gross profit 365 my new profit before tax 165 and my new profit after tax 115 and then you, every other line item doesn't change so what we're gone from here in the question profit was 90 and now the profit has gone up to 115 so when we alter or change an accounting policy here the impact is a net increase of 25 which of course is the difference here the net increase here for last year was 15 which was the difference between your opening and closing inventory adjustments so there are what your restated financial statements the PLs should look like 42 last year and what you would say there actually in the account it will be said it will be restated that's the way when you publish the 2017 accounts so you'll see where the adjustments are and because you're making the adjustment this year this is just the true accounts they are only draft ones that are given because you're only updating it this year before you finalize the financial statements so that's your first key adjustment is to figure out what adjustments would happen to p l each year but now we have to figure out what about the statement changes in equity And this is only for 2017 so we don't go back and look at 2016 so the 31st of the third 2017 and we're just interested in retained earnings so we look at the opening balance opening balance the first of the fourth 2016. this is before any adjustments were made because we have to figure out now how do we present this well, the opening balance and retained earnings at the start of this year would have been the balance in 2015, 1160, plus the unadjusted profit for 2016. We're trying to get the um, we're trying to get the first of April 2016, which is the end of this year, end of the prior year, which is 1160 plus 27. Now you might say, well, why are you not why are you not using the 42 instead of the 27? This is before the adjustments. This is how we present the adjustments in the statement changes in equity. So we're saying using FIFO. Then what we say here is another line item, change in accounting policy. And then you'll have restatus, opening balance, first to the fourth, 16. So what we're saying here is well, if we come to the start of the current year what was the retrospective impact on retained earnings 
for all previous years. And the retrospective impact here was an increase of 15,000 in last year's profits and an increase in 20,000 in 2015 profits. So if we had done this last year and the year before, our retained earnings would have been 35,000 higher. Because we're assuming we're doing a few now on this. This is how it's presented in the statement change initially. So last year's retained earnings have gone up by 15, so to account for that, because we haven't accounted for it in the open balance here. And 2015 profits would have been gone up by 20. So that means by restated balance at the start of this year is 1.222 million. And what you do for the year is then you say profit for 2017. Be careful now, is the updated amount 115. Your closing retained earnings at the end of the year is 1337. So this year is fine because these are just in draft form, so we can update them as we go. In previous years, because they would have already been formalized and approved, you have to go back and restate them. And that means your opening balance. Your closing balance retained earnings last year from the accounts with the old accounting policy would have been 1187. So you have to reconcile from that balance to the updated or the restated one. So you have to just show the user financial statements where are the impacts coming from. So that's quite tricky in terms of IASAs and how you retrospectively go back. You have to make sure if there's a change in the accounting policy, the impact of that on the opening balance will be shown in retained earnings. And that's quite an important aspect uh, in terms of IESAs. And of course, if you want to, you could do another column for revaluation reserve because you have 90,000 OCI that year. But really, the focus for this one was how does the retained earnings column look? And you will see that uh, the accounting for a prior period error is similar. You have to, this would just be said here prior period error, and you restate the opening balance as well. So when you're accounting for either a change in accounting policy, or a prior period error under ISAs, that's how they would appear in the statement change initially. And you'll see some of them in the question pack, and you'll also see them in past exam papers, particularly in question areas. All right, so that was looking at question one uh, from tutorial week 10, focused on ISAs, change in accounting policy, and particularly IS2 as well, changing from FIFO methods to WAFO methods. But we're now going to go on and have a look at question two, which is split into three issues. The first one is IACAs again, uh, dealing with a property. Uh, this is an investment property uh, that we're now going to change the accounting policy. And what we come down here then, issue two and issue three are IFS 15, looking at revenue recognition and particular issues associated with that. So the first one we're looking at here is a particular investment property bought in 2015, and it's now the end of 2016. Uh, they held it a cost model, but what they're thinking of now is they're thinking of changing to the fair value model uh, as part of this annual review. So the, in 2016, they decided to change the fair value model. Now, changing from the cost model to the fair value model under IS40 is a change in accounting policy. There's an exception in IS16 where you change from the cost model to the revaluation model. That isn't a change in accounting policy. You don't have to retrospectively go back, whereas IS40 is not an exception. You do have to go back. So what you're essentially saying is you've done the 2015 accounts. You've held the investment property at cost and you've charged depreciation as you would normally do under that model. But come to 2016, you're saying we now want to change the model and change the fair value. You would have to go back and restate the 2015 accounts as if it was held at the fair value model. And we want to know what impact will it have on retained earnings as well. So if you take it here, this is question two. Uh, what we're looking at here is your investment property. The cost of the investment property is 1.4 million. And your depreciation you would have charged in 2015. The depreciation would have been, just be careful now, there's a residual value of 400,000. So it's a million divided by 40. So 25,000 per annum. So in 2015, your entry would have been debit the SOPL, credit investment property, 25,000, 25,000. Right, so that's what the adjustment would have been. And the net book value 
So the net book value of this investment property at the end of 15 would have been 1.4 million minus 25,000. So it would have been 1.375 million. Now remember, we're changing the accounting policy in 2016, but we have to go back and say, we have to retrospectively adjust 2015's account as well. So that would have meant here, the fair value at the end of 2015, 1380. So we don't adjust the, the depreciation or anything because the fair value the first time would have been at the end of 2015. So what you're saying there's an increase of 5,000. So the adjustments that would happen here is, you will debit accumulated depreciation because once he holds that fair value, the accumulated depreciation has to be removed, 25,000. You will credit the investment property to bring it from 1.4 million cost down to 1.38 million fair value. And you will credit opening retained earnings, 5,000. So what essentially we're saying here is you made a 5,000 fair value gain. Now, why I say open retained earnings is that technically is in the 2015 accounts. But if we're preparing the 2016 accounts, it's going to be in the opening retained earnings in the statement of change in equity. So in your SOC extract, like we've seen in the previous question, you'll have retained earnings. You will have opening balance, first of the first 16. You will have change in accounting policy, like we had above. So that's going to be X. That's going to be plus 5,000. And then you're going to have restated opening balance, first the first 16. So that's the way it would look. That's where the 5,000 will come in, because technically that 5,000 is an adjustment to last year's accounts. It is in retained earnings, but it doesn't go through the PL in 2016. So that's how you deal with 2015. And 2016, then, you just readjust it as if the fair value model had always been held. So the opening fair value investment property was your 1380. And your closing fair value investment property, we're given in the question, was 1430. So that's a fair value increase of 50,000. And we know then if we are holding the fair value model, there should have been no depreciation and all the fair value movements should go to the PL. That's how the IS40 fair value model works. What we're told in the question is depreciation has been charged for the current period. We need to reverse that. And they've recorded a fair value adjustment of 30, bringing it from 14 up to 1430, which is not right. So what you're going to do is so you're going to debit accumulated depreciation because you assume that's where the entry was this year and credit your SO, credit your SOP at. Because you're saying depreciation shouldn't have been charged because if you're holding at the fair value model now from the end of 2015 onwards, you shouldn't have charged that. So you just adjust that this year. This is not a retrospective adjustment because this is the current year's accounts. So it's easier to make adjustments here than it is in prior year. And then you're going to debit investment property 20 because you're told they've already recorded, if you look here, they've already recorded 30,000 of a fair value adjustment. It should have been 50. So we're going to record the other 20 credit SOPL 20. So they would have been the other adjustments required in 2016 to get you where you need to be at the end of the year. Right, so there is a good bit of work there, but the key thing is about the prior year adjustment, and that goes through the opening balance retained earnings in 2016. Right. And then, of course, you'll update these to get your adjusted profit for this year. And that just goes in as normal, adding on to retained earnings. But the key point here is that you know where and how to make uh, a prior year adjustment. That's the same as if it's a uh, prior period error or a change in accounting policy. Right. So that brings us on then to issue two, which is from a past exam paper, uh, looking at Lockjaw, which is IFS 15. Right, so provide the name of the accounting standard we know is IFS 15 and list the five general steps. So you can go back and have a look at those steps. Uh, we have them here. Let's see uh, in terms of this one. So identify the contract with the customer. Identify the performance obligations, which we often call promises. So when we said, for example, if you buy a mobile phone plan, 
you probably get a handset and you get a 12 or 24 month contract. They are two separate performance obligations under IFRS 15. You get the transaction price, whatever it is, fixed consideration, variable consideration. You then allocate that price to performance obligations. So four is a combination of two and three. So if you have a mobile phone handset and you have a 12 month plan, you have to divvy up the payments. How much of that is actually attributable to the handset? Because that's going to be recognized in step five at a point in time. And then how much is going to be attributable to the actual, your access to the network, uh, which you're paying for as well, which is going to be recognized over time, uh, over your 12 month or 24 month period. So that's where step five comes in. Recognize the revenue as the obligations are fulfilled. So again, that was a past exam question, just you getting the basics of the standards. And then you're asked for the journal entries for 2017 and 2018 for this particular package. So you're told they offer a cold storage service to customers. And at the year end, one of their customers paid 30,000 cash for an order of frozen goods. So their products and a two year storage contract with Lockjaw. So this is what we call a bundled package. They're happy to agree to the package and the standalone selling price of the goods are 10,000 and the standalone selling price of the service is 30,000, 15,000 a year. So what we're saying here is if you bought them standalone, it would have been 40,000, but the customer got a bundle deal for 30. And what you have to try and figure out now is that's the transaction price, which is your step three. You have two performance obligations. One is the goods. The other one is the storage contract. You will recognize the revenue for the goods straight away because once the goods pass over, you'll recognize the revenue from the storage contract over the life of the storage contract, which is two years. So this is what we call unbundling uh, a particular transaction. So if we look at it here, the bundle deal is worth 30,000. Now we know the components in that deal are the performance obligations. They're made up of the products, and the two year contract. Now, one of the rules under IES or IFRS 15, I should say, is allocate the transaction price. How do we allocate that 30,000 that we have to these? You allocate them based on their standalone selling prices, 10,000 and 30,000. So what you're saying there is 25%, which is 10 over 40, represents the amount of revenue earned for the products. 75% represents the amount of money earned by the two year contract. It's not that you're earning these amounts, but you're allocating the discount proportionally as well. You're saying you're not just giving the discount off one or the other, it must be allocated based on what we call standalone selling prices. So that means the revenue for the product will be one quarter of 30, which is seven and a half. The revenue for the two year contract will be three quarters of 30, which is 22 and a half. And that's how you're gonna allocate it out. Now that's your step four. Step one is the contract, which is a given here. Step two, identify the performance obligations. We have two separate ones, goods and service. Step three, get the transaction price, straightforward enough here. Step four, allocate it out. And now we have to step five, account for the revenue recognition. So in 2017, it has to be debit bank 30. Why? Because that's the money that you've received on that date. You're gonna recognize the revenue for the product seven and a half, because that's the portion of the revenue you said is attributable to the product and once the product is sold to the customer and they take the risks and reward of ownership, you can recognize the revenue. You cannot recognize any of the revenue for the two year contract until it is earned. And because you're told here, this sale was at the end of the year, that means none of that storage contract has been earned in 2017. So this is gonna be called instead credit deferred revenue. What we mean there, it's essentially like a liability of 22 and a half. And you will recognize that next year and the year after when you earn the money from the storage contract. It's the same as we looked at in our tutorial 
our lecture on RFS 15, where you looked at Ryanair and they had a liability for unearned income. This is unearned income. And that will split between 50% will be current liabilities, the amount you're going to earn next year, and 50% will be non-current liability. So presentation is important as well as when do you expect to earn it? Um, half of next year, half of the year after, because it's a two-year contract. Then in 2018, what happens? No money changes hands. What happens is you take debit deferred income, deferred revenue, and you're going to debit deferred revenue half of it, because one year is now earned, 11,250, and you credit revenue. So you're what we call releasing it to the income statement as it is earned. So that means in deferred revenue at the end of 2018, you've only 11,250 left. You've taken one of it out, and that will be all current liability, because in 2019, you're earning the last tranche, i.e. half, uh, of the contract. So that, that's an important concept to understand is debundling a product and service and recognizing it then either at a point in time, typically for the products, or over a period of time, which is typically the service contract. And that is not untypical thinking of computers and service arrangements, thinking of uh, warranty agreements, thinking of mobile phone plans. And that was a significant change uh, as part of IRFS 15 as well. All right, and the last thing we're looking at then is issue three, which is uh, Lenny's from the summer 2019 paper. And uh, this sold close to sales value of 100 million during the year, during the month of December, a 30 day right of return period. So when we see a right of return, that means the sales that are made are not guaranteed sales because within the next 30 days, customer can bring them, bring the goods back. You have them in inventory then, and they want a refund of their money. So what you're told here is they make a profit margin of 20%. 40% of the goods are still in the return period. So 40 million. And they expect 10 million of these goods will actually be returned. So based on past experience, but to date they've just recognized the full 100 million as revenue and as well as the full cost of sales. So under IFRS 15, we're looking for this terminology when you're talking about a question. This is what we call variable consideration because we're not exactly sure how much we're going to get in until the right of return period is finished. And under IFRS 15, you must put your best estimate, which Lenny's has said is 10%. So part A is a nice little general one. You can look at the solution yourself there, but that was it, asked in the exam last summer. Name the accounting standards. We know from the tutorial it's IFRS 15. Definition of revenue and a general definition of a contract. So you can have a look at those in the solution. They're not overly task at, taxing, but it's important that you do know your theory around the standards as well, not just your debits and credits. So what Lainey's has done, if they've recognized the full revenue, 100 million, even though they have the expectation that a certain portion of these customers are going to return the goods. And in IFRS 15, they say that's not allowed. You must put in your best estimate of the variable consideration. So we're saying here if that of the 100 million sales in December, 40% are still within the 30 day period. So at the year end, there's still 40 million of goods that could be returned. And Linney's best estimate is 10% or 4 million will be returned. So the best estimate of returns at the 31st of 12th, 2018. Now remember, it, it, not that they're going to be returned at that date. It's that at that point in time, for January that's coming, there's a certain amount of sales that we expect to be returned is 4 million. And uh, instead of recognize that in revenue, because remember, you have the money come in. What would have they've done is they've debited a bank. They've credited a revenue. They've done 100 million. That's what they've entered. IFRS 15 says that's not correct because you expect 4 million of that to be returned. So what you're going to do is debit revenue, credit, refund liability. And that will be a current liability of 4 million. So you actually only recognize 96 million revenue, which is your best estimate of the revenue at that date. And the refund liability then is the amount of money you expect to have to give back to customers when they get the money in. So that's the first key point is making that recognition. You only recognize revenue that you expect to get in. The second thing then is, it's important as well is, well, what about cost of sales? 
because you've the 100 million recognized in revenue and you have the full cost of sales to match that figure because the matching principle is a fundamental concept in accounting. So IFRS 15 says, whatever portion of revenue you don't recognize, well, it doesn't make sense to have the cost of sale there because you're not, you're not having it on the P&L at all. So what you do is you're going to debit a right of return asset and credit cost of sales. So it doesn't say to just bring it back into inventory and leave it off cost of sales because technically it's not in inventory. It's been sold onto the customer. Instead, what IFRS 15 says is you should recognize this thing called a right of return asset. That is, you expect a certain amount of returns to happen. And that means when the return happens and you pay, pay the refund liability, you're going to get an asset in return. So you're going to get that asset back into inventory and you're assuming it's of resaleable quality. Um, or condition when it comes in. But you don't recognize that the 4 million, because remember inventory and these elements are measured at cost. That's why you're told what the margin is. Margin is 20%. So that means the cost associated with this will be 3.2 million. That's the, where students get caught out. So you're essentially saying here, 3.2 million. So what you're seeing, when they are initially recorded, they debited bank credit revenue 100 million and they debited cost of sales, let's say credit of purchases, whatever we want to do it, uh, 80 million. So bring it all through cost of sales. But we know if we're taking out 4 million of revenue, we must take out the corresponding amount of cost of sales. Otherwise our cost of sales are overstated. And what we create then is we don't put them back into inventory, we call it a new asset, right of return asset, which is still a current asset. These are the inventories we expect to get back in early 2019, and we give back a refund liability on um, accordingly. So just as an example then, what happens in 2019? This is not asked for, but in 2019, if the refunds do come in, so refunds of 4 million come in as expected, what happens? Well, you credit bank and you debit refund liability, 4 million. So all that happens there is nothing goes through the P&L. You just debit the refund liability that you had from the year end and that's paid off. And in this case, you credit the right of use asset to get rid of that and you just debit inventory. So the reason we can debit inventory now is if the goods have been returned, they're now in our control and they're now part of inventory, 3.2 million. Right. So that's what happens if the refunds come in as expected. For example, if only half the refunds come in as expected, the other half can be recognized as revenue then when you're certain that there's gonna be no refund. So it just depends on what happens. So for example, if only 50% were refunded and the rest just remain the sales, what you would do there is you would credit bank 2 million because you only get half the refund. You would debit refund liability, be careful now, 4 million because that needs to be removed completely. And the other, you would credit revenue 2 million. So what that means is you thought 4 million were going to be uh, looking for a refund. So you didn't recognize the revenue there. Turns out only half of them wanted a refund, so the other half are valid. So you can put that revenue through the 2019 accounts. Same with the right of use asset. You will credit the right of use asset, still the full amount, but in this case now, you're going to debit cost of sales, 1.6 million, to match the revenue you've just recognized, half of it. And then you'll debit inventory, the other half, which is the amount that was refunded, 50%. So it just depends on the question of what type of way it comes up, but it's important you do have an idea of the possible adjustments that are required after the accounting period when the, re the returns do or do not happen. Because remember, at the year end in this question, this is an estimate. Right? These estimates can be right or wrong, and it depends then what happens after the year end and how you account for it subsequently. Right, so that's um, question two looked at IAS 8 and also two elements of IFRS 15. How to deal with a bundle plan 
and to allocate uh, revenue or prices to per each performance obligation, and also how to deal with a right of return, which is both two very popular and frequently examined topics in IFRS 15.